the children reminds me that it is for the sake of our children that we fight to shape America into a nation that is safe for all of its citizens without racial discrimination. Americans must learn to stop fighting one another in the name of race and to start fighting for one another in the name of peace and progress. America must learn to match her rhetoric about freedom and brotherhood with her civic behavior at the ballot box. America must stop claiming to be one nation under God with liberty and justice for all while electing unethical leaders who set unjust policies that deliberately disenfranchise citizens of color in this country. There are people who occupy high places of power in this country who are radically committed to keeping certain Americans totally free while keeping other Americans partially free. They rigidly protect a racial caste system in this country at all cost. They assign value to racial groups within the caste system based upon whether their skin and mental consciousness measure up to whiteness. God has sent prophet after prophet to America declaring that such racial arrangement of inequality is unjust. However, every prophet sent was either strategically ignored or violently killed. Many of the great prophetic voices of the past have had a direct connection to this church, such as Frederick Douglass, John Brown, Sojourner Truth, Carter G. Woodson, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, and Ralph Bunch. The descendants of these prophetic voices serve notice to America today. We say to America, your freedom clock has run out. America, your fight has not been with African Americans. Your fight has been with the God of righteousness, truth, and justice. Your fight is with the God who stands in solidarity with the oppressed. Our biblical text this morning describes the intense struggle between an enslaving Pharaoh and the God of liberation. God eventually serves a death blow to Pharaoh by crushing Pharaoh's regime and breaking the back of Pharaoh's national arrogance and pride. For 430 years, Pharaoh weaponized death against the oppressed. Now death would be weaponized against Pharaoh and his royal regime. At midnight, the text says, the deadly horror story unfolds in Pharaoh's royal palace. Pharaoh awakens to the piercing sound of screaming cries. Grief gushed through the tear ducts of Pharaoh's eyes as the plague of death gradually fell upon his nation. The scripture says there was not a house in Egypt without someone dead in it. Pharaoh stood at the mercy of a slave people in their God. The sting of death forced Pharaoh's tongue to admit he had fallen into the hands of an angry God. Pharaoh like all dictators, despots, and tyrants, have the limited power to defend themselves against many things, but they do not have the power to defend themselves against the power of death. Pharaoh was surrounded by guards and soldiers, but they could not stop death's invasive entry into the royal palace. Pharaoh's borders were safely secured but no fortified fence or wide wall 
could prevent death's victory march into Pharaoh's homeland. All the empire's weapons melted into nothingness in the face of the grim reaper. Death is the great equalizer. Sanctions cannot control death. Wealth cannot bribe death. Bombs cannot blast death. Assassins cannot assassinate death. Prisons cannot incarcerate death. Capital punishment cannot execute death. Threats cannot intimidate death. Diplomacy cannot cajole death. Orators cannot dissuade death. Insurance companies could not write enough policies to cover the devastating loss of life among Pharaoh's people. On this night in the royal palace, death had set into motion the national collapse of one of the most powerful empires in the history of human civilization. On this night, Pharaoh would regret his sadistic addiction to holding Moses' people in perpetual bondage for 430 years. While Pharaoh unjustly dominated the weak, the weak were making their appeal against Pharaoh to the God of all power. In Exodus 3, 7 and 8, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of the slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. In Exodus 3, 9 and 10, God said, and now the cry of the Israelites reached me and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. The divine creator is still connected to the nerve center of the oppressed. He counts every salty tear that falls from their saddened eyes. He knows the musical texture and the tone of their heartfelt cries. The text says that during the night, the pain of death grew so intense that Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people. You and the Israelites go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said, go and go and bless me. Go and bless me. Pharaoh had the audacity yeah. to tell Moses that as you and your people leave, bless me. Even though Pharaoh's political machinery had driven the face of Moses' people into the ground of indignity with the impunity for 400 years, Pharaoh says, bless me. After the long trek of continued oppression under the blazing whip of injustice, Pharaoh says, bless me. Regardless of the carnage and destruction he had visited upon Moses' people, Pharaoh's royal sense of privilege pushed him to say to Moses, bless me. We might immediately ask, why should Moses and his people even entertain the idea of blessing Pharaoh? Why should Moses and his people bless a leader who ordered their innocent infants to be tossed into the river and drowned to death? Why should Moses and his people bless the person who authorized their unrelenting torture, pain, and abuse? As we look at America's unrepentant attitude towards the perpetual enslavement of Africans brought to these shores on slave ships, African Americans might be asking similar questions today. Why should we bless those who hung up black bodies in the backwoods of Mississippi on trees like they hung up pork meat in Tennessee smokehouses? 
Why should we bless those who threw the mangled 14 year old body of Emmett Till into the Black Bottom River? Why should we bless those who blasted four little girls to their death during their Sunday school class in Birmingham, Alabama at the 16th Street Baptist Church? Why should we bless those who shot Medgar Evers in his back in front of his wife and small children? Why should we bless those who cleverly orchestrated the assassination of Malcolm X, once known as Detroit Red, during a religious service in Harlem, New York? Why should we bless those who shot Martin Luther King Jr. in his neck on a hotel balcony in Memphis, Tennessee, in front of his top aides? Why would someone who caused so much pain in the lives of others for 400 years be given the benefit of a blessing by the very people that they sought to destroy? Now, Moses had a million reasons not to bless Pharaoh. Moses had a million good reasons to feel offended by such an insensitive demand. Yet, on the other hand, Moses had a trillion good reasons not to get bogged down into bitterness. Moses had a trillion good reasons not to become reckless in rage. Moses had a trillion good reasons not to become aimlessly angry. Moses had a trillion good reasons to become not to become a hostage to hostility. Moses focused on the destiny that God had set before him. Moses chose not to waste his time cursing Pharaoh. God had already set Pharaoh's curse into effect. And there was nothing that Moses nor Pharaoh could do to promote nor prevent the curse that had already fallen upon Pharaoh and his nation. Moses could have stood before Pharaoh begging and pleading and expecting him to undo 430 years of oppression. Moses and his people still would not have been one step closer to the promised land. Like Joseph, who was sold into slavery at the hands of his own biological brothers, Moses found the wisdom and the strength to understand Pharaoh may have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What shall we as a people do today to pursue the destiny that God has placed before us? Will we allow the sick past of our oppressors to poison the health of our bright lit future? What we as a people have been through has only prepared us for the promised land. According to the text in Exodus, the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people of Israel. They gave them what they asked for. And the text says, so they plundered the Egyptians. I want to say that it's plundering time. It's plundering season. It's time to make plundering history, plunder knowledge, plunder wisdom, plunder understanding, plunder education, plunder all of the economic opportunities that are set before us. The text says that they took bread with them from Egypt. I just want to say, get your bread and take it with you. Make sure that the bread that you get is light bread, full of light that can enlighten your mind and to help you see the future that God has prepared for his oppressed people once enslaved. Make sure that the bread that you get is the living bread. Make sure that the bread that you get comes from the oven of God's mouth. The text tells us that in the process of liberation, God stayed up all night long keeping vigil. God stayed awake to make sure that the Israelites made it to their destination. I want to inform you today that God is still keeping vigil over his people in the land of oppression. God has watched over us all the days of our lives. And while danger lurked all around us on every side, God kept vigil over us. 
while we swam across rivers hid in the deep southern forest along the underground railroad god kept vigil over us while we self-taught ourselves with hand-me-down school books inside third world conditions god kept vigil over us while we were relegated to riding on the back of the bus and entering businesses and homes through the back door god kept vigil over us while ahmaud aubrey brianna taylor sandra bland and george floyd were brutally murdered like wild game being slaughtered during deer season god kept vigil over us god keeps vigil over us still by day and by night no matter how many presidents backed by militias and white supremacists get elected god still keeps vigil over his people no matter how many vigilante uprisings happen to prevent the peaceful transfer of power in this nation god still keeps vigil over his people no matter how many bogus election laws are put on the books to disenfranchise targeted groups help me somebody god still keeps vigil over his people why should i feel discouraged and why should the shadows come why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven heaven and home when jesus is my portion my constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and i know that he watches over me we sing because we're happy we sing because we're free we sing because his eye is on the sparrow and we sing because he watches over us lift your head all your children and remember that there is a great camp meeting in the promised land don't look too much at where you came from but don't forget where you came from but don't lose sight about where you're going to if you want to know something about me don't ask about my background ask about my foreground it's not just about where i've been it's about where i am going and i just want to encourage us keep your eyes on the vision that god has for god's people and see through his eyes what he has in store for his people and as we keep our eyes on him god will keep his eye on every force and every power that would seek to obstruct our total freedom as we live in this world it is my hope and it is my prayer that despite all of the chaos and confusion we see swirling around us that we will find some time to be quiet and to be still and to be totally in the presence of God so that God can open up the inner eyes of our sanctified imagination to show us which direction to go in as a people so we will not continue to stagger into communal chaos. May he help us as we keep our eyes fixed on that city that is seeking to come down and to impact the current world in which we live. Let us keep our eyes on the Christ because it is through Christ that we're able to find purpose and meaning and reason for continuing to live in the world as salt and light. There are many things that we can be bitter about, but let us not allow our burdens to make us bitter, but let us allow them to make us better. Let us not become filled with hostility and anger because when you're filled with hostility and anger, you destroy your own creativity. You get so mad you can't see straight. But when you allow God to arrest the hostility that is in you over what has happened to you, God then gives you a fresh vision of where he's trying to lead you. And we will not only be celebrating the movements of the past, but we will be in step with the God who is in control of the movements of today and the movements of the future. May God bless you.
as you continue to meditate upon what we have shared today. Thank you.